Hey everyone, welcome back to the Children of Our Lady podcast, brought to you by the Catholic Family Podcast. My name is Thomas, and I thank you all for being here today. Well, in last week's episode, we concluded the wonderful journey of the first part of the Glories of Mary, and now as we move into this new stage, a temporary stage before we go into that second part of the Glories of Mary. With Lent right around the corner, I thought it would be most fitting for us to take a step away from the other readings and other mysteries of Our Lady's life and focus more in on her sorrows. Now, for most of the listeners, if you remember back in September, we went through St. Alphonsus' seven different reflections on the seven sorrows of Our Lady. And there was also a chapter from the book in the second part of The Glories of Mary where St. Alphonsus talks about Our Lady as the Queen of Martyrs. And so I took some time to think about what I wanted to do for the show during the Lent season, and I thought that for this episode and the next, I would go through that chapter on the Dolors of Mary, the one that we have not gone through here on the Children of Our Lady podcast yet. And then throughout the season of Lent, I thought I would just go ahead and repost each of those seven different reflections on the seven sorrows of Our Lady. Whether you all had a chance to listen to them back in September or not, I found that myself going through them periodically over time, it is very beneficial, and each time there seems to be new fruit or or some good reminders of what we've reflected on in the past. And this way it also gives me some time to prepare content for the next stage of the Glories of Mary that I'd really like to get into after Easter, which is going into that second part of the Glories of Mary. So even though throughout the season of Lent it'll be reposts of old content that's been posted on the Children of Our Lady podcast in the past, I think that'll be more fitting for this season, and I'm excited when the time does come to get into that second part of the Glories of Mary, of course if God permits us to have the opportunity to do so. So like I said here on today's episode, we begin the chapter from the Glories of Mary on the Dolors of Mary, which is a little bit lengthy, so I thought I'd go ahead and divide it into two separate episodes. And we'll go ahead and get right into our reading and come back for a few more words, our quote, and our prayer to Our Lady. Discourse 9 of the Dolors of Mary Mary was the queen of martyrs, for her martyrdom was longer and greater than that of all the martyrs. Who can ever have a heart so hard that it will not melt on hearing the most lamentable event which once occurred in the world? There was a noble and holy mother who had an only son. This son was the most amiable that can be imagined, innocent, virtuous, beautiful, who loved his mother most tenderly, so much so that he had never caused her the least displeasure, but had ever shown her all respect, obedience, and affection. Hence this mother had placed all her affections on earth in this son. Hear, then, what happened. This son, through envy, was falsely accused by his enemies, and though the judge knew and himself confessed that he was innocent, yet, that he might not offend his enemies, he condemned him to the ignominious death that they had demanded. This poor mother had to suffer the grief of seeing that amiable and beloved son unjustly snatched from her in the flower of his age by a barbarous death. For, by dint of torments and drained of all his blood, he was made to die on an infamous gibbet in a public place of execution, and this before her own eyes. Devout souls, what say you? Is not this event, and is not this unhappy mother worthy of compassion? You already understand of whom I speak. This son, so cruelly executed, was our loving Redeemer Jesus. And this mother was the Blessed Virgin Mary, who for the love she bore us was willing to see him sacrificed to divine justice by the barbarity of men. This great torment, then, which Mary endured for us, a torment which was more than a thousand deaths, deserves both our compassion and our gratitude. If we can make no other return for so much love, at least let us give a few moments this day to consider the greatness of the sufferings by which Mary became the Queen of Martyrs. For the sufferings of her great martyrdom exceeded those of all the martyrs, being in the first place the longest in point of duration, and in the second place the greatest in point of intensity. First point. As Jesus is called the King of Sorrows and the King of Martyrs because he suffered during his life more than all other martyrs, so also is Mary with reason called the Queen of Martyrs, having merited this title by suffering the most cruel martyrdom possible after that of her son. Hence, with reason, was she called by Richard of St. Lawrence, the martyr of martyrs. And of her can the words of Isaiah with all truth be said, He will crown thee with a crown of tribulation. That is to say, that that suffering itself, which exceeded the suffering of all the other martyrs united, was the crown by which she was shown to be the queen of martyrs. That Mary was a true martyr cannot be doubted, as Denis the Carthusian, Pelbart, Catharinus, and others prove. 
for it is an undoubted opinion that suffering sufficient to cause death is martyrdom, even though death does not ensue from it. St. John the Evangelist is revered as a martyr, though he did not die in the cauldron of boiling oil, but came out more vigorous than he went in. St. Thomas says that to have the glory of martyrdom, it is sufficient to exercise obedience in its highest degree. That is to say, to be obedient unto death. Mary was a martyr, says St. Bernard, not by the sword of the executioner, but by bitter sorrow of heart. If her body was not wounded by the hand of the executioner, her blessed heart was transfixed by a sort of grief at the passion of her son, grief which was sufficient to have caused her death not once but a thousand times. From this we shall see that Mary was not only a real martyr, but that her martyrdom surpassed all others, for it was longer than that of all others, and her whole life may be said to have been a prolonged death. The passion of Jesus, as St. Bernard says, commenced with his birth. So also did Mary, in all things like unto her son, endure her martyrdom throughout her life. Amongst other significations of the name of Mary, as Blessed Albert the Great asserts, is that of a bitter sea. Hence to her is applicable the text of Jeremiah's, Great as the sea is thy destruction. For as the sea is all bitter and salt, so also was the life of Mary always full of bitterness at the sight of the passion of the Redeemer, which was ever present to her mind. There can be no doubt that, enlightened by the Holy Ghost in a far higher degree than all of the prophets, she, far better than they, understood the predictions recorded by them in the sacred scriptures concerning the Messiah. This is precisely what the angel revealed to St. Bridget, and he also added that the Blessed Virgin, even before she became his mother, knowing how much the Incarnate Word was to suffer for the salvation of men, and compassionating this innocent Savior, who was to be so cruelly put to death for crimes not his own, even then began her great martyrdom. Her grief was immeasurably increased when she became the mother of this Savior, so that at the sad sight of the many torments which were to be endured by her poor son, she indeed suffered a long martyrdom, a martyrdom which lasted her whole life. This was signified with great exactitude to St. Bridget in a vision which she had in Rome, in the church of St. Mary Major, where the Blessed Virgin, with St. Simeon, and an angel bearing a very long sword, reddened with blood, appeared to her, denoting thereby the long and bitter grief which transpierced the heart of Mary during her whole life. Whence the above name Rupert supposes Mary thus speaking, Redeemed souls and my beloved children, do not pity me only for the hour in which I beheld my dear Jesus expiring before my eyes. For the sword of sorrow predicted by Simeon pierced my soul during the whole of my life. When I was giving suck to my son, when I was warming him in my arms, I already foresaw the bitter death that awaited him. Consider then what long and bitter sorrows I must have endured. Wherefore Mary might well say in the words of David, My life is wasted with grief, and my years in sighs. My sorrow is continually before me. My whole life was spent in sorrow and in tears, for my sorrow, which was compassion for my beloved son, never departed from before my eyes, as I always foresaw the sufferings and death which he was one day to endure. The Divine Mother herself revealed to St. Bridget that, even after the death and ascension of her son, whether she ate or worked, the remembrance of his passion was ever deeply impressed on her mind, and fresh in her tender heart. Hence, Towler says that the Most Blessed Virgin spent her whole life in continual sorrow, for her heart was always occupied with sadness and with suffering. Therefore time, which usually mitigates the sorrows of the afflicted, did not relieve Mary, nay, even it increased her sorrow, for, as Jesus on the one hand advanced in age, and always appeared more and more beautiful and amiable, so also, on the other hand, the time of his death always drew nearer, and grief always increased in the heart of Mary, at the thought of having to lose him on earth. So that in the words addressed by the angel to St. Bridget, as the rose grows up amongst thorns, so the mother of God advanced in years in the midst of sufferings. And as the thorns increased with the growth of the rose, so also did the thorns of her sorrows increase in Mary, the chosen rose of the Lord, as she advanced in age. And so much the more deeply did they pierce her heart. Having now considered the length of this sorrow in point of duration, let us pass to the second point, its greatness in point of intensity. Second point. Ah, Mary was not only queen of martyrs, but her martyrdom was longer than that of all others, but also because it was the greatest of all martyrdoms. Who, however, can measure its greatness? Jeremiah seems unable to find any one with whom he can compare this mother of sorrows when he considers her great sufferings at the death of her son. To what shall I compare thee, or to what shall I liken thee, O daughter of Jerusalem? For great as the sea is thy destruction, who shall heal thee? Wherefore, Cardinal Hugo, in a commentary on these words, says, 
O blessed virgin, as the sea in bitterness exceeds all other bitterness, so does thy grief exceed all other grief. Hence St. Anselm asserts that, had not God by a special miracle preserved the life of Mary in each moment of her life, her grief was such that it would have caused her death. St. Bernadine of Siena goes so far as to say that the grief of Mary was so great that, were it divided amongst all men, it would suffice to cause their immediate death. But let us consider the reasons for which Mary's martyrdom was greater than that of all martyrs. In the first place, we must remember that the martyrs endured their torments, which were the effect of fire and other material agencies, in their bodies. Mary suffered hers in her soul, as St. Simeon foretold, and thy own soul a sword shall pierce. As if the holy old man had said, O most sacred virgin, the bodies of other martyrs will be torn with iron, but thou wilt be transfixed and martyred in thy soul by the passion of thine own son. Now, as the soul is more noble than the body, so much greater were Mary's sufferings than those of all the martyrs, as Jesus Christ himself said to St. Catherine of Siena, Between the sufferings of the soul and those of the body, there is no comparison. Whence the holy abbot Arnold of Chartres says, that whoever had been present on Mount Calvary to witness the great sacrifice of the Immaculate Lamb, would there have beheld two great altars, the one in the body of Jesus, the other in the heart of Mary. For on that mount, at the same time that the Son sacrificed his body by death, Mary sacrificed her soul by compassion. Moreover, says St. Antoninus, while other martyrs suffered by sacrificing their own lives, the Blessed Virgin suffered by sacrificing her Son's life, a life that she loved far more than her own, so that she not only suffered in her soul all that her son endured in his body, but moreover the sight of her son's torments brought more grief to her heart than if she had endured them all in her own person. No one can doubt that Mary suffered in her heart all the outrages which she saw inflicted on her beloved Jesus. Anyone can understand that the sufferings of children are also those of their mothers who witness them. St. Augustine, considering the anguish endured by the mother of the Maccabees in witnessing the tortures of her sons, says, she, seeing their sufferings, suffered in each one. Because she loved them all, she endured in her soul what they endured in their flesh. Thus also did Mary suffer all those torments, scourges, thorns, nails, and the cross, which tortured the innocent flesh of Jesus, all entered at the same time into the heart of this blessed virgin to complete her martyrdom. He suffered in the flesh, and she in her heart, writes the blessed Amadeus. So much so, says St. Lawrence Justinian, that the heart of Mary became, as it were, a mirror of the passion of the Son, in which might be seen, faithfully reflected, the spitting, the blows and wounds, and all that Jesus suffered. St. Bonaventure also remarks that those wounds which were scattered over the body of our Lord were all united in the single heart of Mary. Thus was our Blessed Lady, through the compassion of her loving heart for her Son, scourged, crowned with thorns, insulted, and nailed to the cross. Whence the same saint, considering Mary on Mount Calvary, present at the death of her son, questions her in these words, O lady, tell me where didst thou stand? Was it only at the foot of the cross? Ah, uh, much more than this, thou wast on the cross itself, crucified with thy son. Richard of St. Lawrence, on the words of the Redeemer spoken by Isaiah the prophet, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the Gentiles there is not a man with me, says, It is true, O Lord, that in the work of human redemption thou didst suffer alone, and that there was not a man who sufficiently pitied thee. But there was a woman with thee, and she was thine own mother. She suffered in her heart all that thou didst endure in thy body. But all this is saying too little of Mary's sorrows, since, as I have already observed, she suffered more in witnessing the sufferings of her beloved Jesus than if she had herself endured all the outrages and death of her son. Erasmus, speaking of parents in general, says that they are more cruelly tormented by their children's sufferings than by their own. This is not always true, but in Mary it evidently was so. For it is certain that she loved her son and his life beyond all comparison, more than herself or a thousand lives of her own. Therefore, blessed Amadeus rightly affirms that the afflicted mother, at the sorrowful sight of the torments of her beloved Jesus, suffered far more than she would have done had she herself endured his whole passion. The reason is evident, for, as St. Bernard says, the soul is more where it loves than where it lives. Our Lord himself had already said the same thing. Where our treasure is, there also is our heart. If Mary then, by love, lived more in her son than in herself, she must have endured far greater torments in the sufferings and death of her son than she would have done had the most cruel death in the world been inflicted upon her. All right, we'll go ahead and stop with our reading for today right there, about halfway through this chapter. 
And even just in this first half of the chapter that we've read today, so many powerful, moving points made by St. Alphonsus. Upon listening to the reading again, I think one of the things that jumps out to me the most is the consideration of the fact that Our Lady's sufferings were so great that had God not given her that supernatural grace to withstand all of the sufferings that she endured, it would have been enough to cause her death. To think about someone enduring sorrow so great that it could cause their death. Of course, it's incomprehensible for us to truly understand the sorrow Our Lady endured. When we consider, even in our little poor way, the great love that Our Lady has for God, it only makes sense that that sorrow is in exact proportion to her love for God. And the other point that really sticks out to me today is one that I think is really good for us to reflect on. Anytime we consider the Passion, anytime we reflect upon the sufferings of our Lord, we can consider also, just as we read today, that all of those different sufferings that our Lord endured in His body, Our Lady endured in her heart. We've reflected and meditated on the many different sufferings our Lord endured in his body. We think about how terrible the scourging was, or the crowning with thorns, or the carrying of the cross, the crucifixion, the piercing of our Lord's side. Well, when we think about just how terrible those sufferings were for our Lord, it really puts it in a whole new light when we consider, as we read today, that Our Lady endured those pains in her heart. And, as we know, Our Lady didn't just simply endure these pains. She endured these pains for us. Our Lady, the co-redemptrix, by her sufferings, all the pain that she endured, the sorrows that she underwent, suffering in union with our Lord, has cooperated in our redemption and in the salvation of our souls. Like we read about in abundance throughout the earlier parts of the glories of Mary, just how much Our Lady loves us and how she loves us as a mother. Well, the love of a mother is so strong, and mothers certainly suffer for their children putting what they endure in the background and focusing more on taking care of their children rather than on tending to their own pains and their own sufferings. I'm sure many of you know maybe of your own mothers or other mother figures in your life who have set that example, putting themselves in the background even though they're in a lot of pain, whether it be emotional or physical, and taking care of their children, taking care of their families. Well, how much more can we say that same thing for Our Lady? How true is that sentiment for her? and her love for us, putting the interest of saving our souls in the forefront of her mind, in the forefront of her will, and cooperating with our Lord in the great work of our redemption. Since there is a whole other half of this chapter, I don't want to go too deep into it, so I think I'll probably stop there, but it is good to say, and for us to be constantly reminded about how much gratitude we owe to Our Lady for all that she endured for us, and to couple that with how much she continues to do for us by her prayers and intercession from her throne in heaven. So, as the beginning of Lent is just days away, our time for penance, our time for sacrifices, our time for suffering is just around the corner. Well, of course, how pleasing would it be to our Lord if we take this Lent, unite with Our Lady, unite with our Sorrowful Mother, and endure the fast, endure the penances, endure the sacrifices, and all the different pains we may undergo, those we plan, maybe in resolutions that we make, or those crosses that God may send us, those trials He may permit us to undergo that we just don't know about. No matter what it is that we may have to go through, we can unite with our Sorrowful Mother, take up our cross, and follow our Lord, and make good use of this Lent, not just in a lukewarm, casual, routine manner, but in a true six, six-and-a-half-week journey toward Calvary. So even though it'll come with many difficulties, what a great opportunity we all have to make this Lent the best Lent we've ever had. Whether young or old, middle-aged, it doesn't matter. We all have an opportunity to offer the pains of our labors and of our sacrifices to God through Mary and in union with her, and hopefully be able to win many graces for the conversion of sinners, the release of the souls in purgatory, graces for ourselves, graces for our family, for our friends, and in the case of those who are bound to the fast, yes, it is an obligation for us to do so, binding under pain of sin, of course. But perhaps during this Lent, we can change our mentality and make it an obligation of love, not an obligation of force. How pleasing would it be to our Lord and Our Lady if we undertook that cross willingly? And we certainly have so many motives to do so, especially when we consider what we read today, all the sufferings Our Lady endured. 
which when we think of the sorrows of Our Lady, of course we naturally think about the pains that Our Lord endured, and vice versa. When we consider the passion of Our Lord, well, hopefully we will all never forget who stood at the foot of His cross, Our Blessed Mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary. So I hope that this Lenten season is great for all of us, and that in no way we try to go through this Lenten season alone, but that we do so in union with Our Blessed Mother. Well, I think that's where I'll stop with my part for today, and we'll go ahead and move into our quote. And St. Alphonsus actually quoted it in today's reading, but to me it's one of the most remarkable quotes when talking about the sorrows that Our Lady endured, to help put in perspective just how much she suffered. And this quote is from St. Bernardine of Siena, and it reads, The grief of Mary was so great that, were it divided amongst all men, it would suffice to cause their immediate death. Well, I think we'll go ahead and conclude our episode today with our own prayer to Our Lady. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Lord Jesus crucified, have mercy on us. Our Lady of Sorrows, pray for us. St. Alphonsus Liguori, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, I thank you all for coming by to today's episode of the Children of Our Lady podcast, brought to you by the Catholic Family Podcast. God bless you all, and Mary keep you. Oh.